I want to thank WPSR for allowing me to introduce Helen Caldercott. I asked for this opportunity because she has made such an important contribution to Seattle, not only through her association with Judy Lipton, who founded WPSR, but by her involvement with Target Seattle, preventing nuclear war in October 1982. So WPSR and Target Seattle are both celebrating a 25th anniversary this year. I was impressed by the overwhelming response to the WPSR conference in 1982. That January, I met Judy Lipton after her return from Holland, where she saw extensive citizen participation in the discussion of how to prevent nuclear war. She told us that all points of view were welcome. From that seed, Target Seattle Preventing Nuclear War developed. After a week of twice daily forums and related activities, at the final event, Helen Caldecott spoke to 25,000 people in the kingdom. I know that experience inspired thousands of people. It certainly inspired me. A few months later, 30 of us went to Tashkent, our sister city in Uzbekistan, to deliver a letter of peace signed by 42,000 during the Target Seattle week. And, uh, burge and the burgeoning of the Seattle USSR connections followed, culminating in the Goodwill Games in 1990. An exhibit of posters and memorabilia from that time is in the room over here. Many of the people involved with Target Seattle went on to found a Seattle park in Tashkent to develop the Partners Project in Ethiopia with Soviets and Seattleites. They helped Gerald and Brousseau and Dane and Perry found Peace Trees Vietnam. They joined 30,000 people marching against the first Gulf War. Perhaps this is an unusual introduction for a remarkable world leader who has kept us focused on avoiding nuclear war and the dangers of nuclear power and the appalling problem of nuclear waste. But I want to pay tribute to all the important outcomes here in Seattle from her leadership. Helen Caldecott. Well, I do feel like a mother. I do feel like I've given birth to something really profound. It was always my feeling ever since I entered first year medical school, I guess, in 1956, that doctors, and I took the Hippocratic Oath, that doctors had a profound responsibility, not just towards our patients, but towards all of creation. I guess as I learned histology and biology, and that's why I'm a pantheist, that I worship nature, and that we in fact understand, I think, biology uh, better than most people on the planet, because we deal with life and death uh, many days, and with the human psyche. I want to acknowledge Judy, um, when I founded Physicians for Social Responsibility, she was one of the first, I don't know how I found Judy, but someone said there's this terrific woman in Seattle. So I rang her up and I said, Judy, I'm coming out and I want you to organize grand runs in every single hospital in Seattle, and she did. I don't know how many hospitals there were, five? And at the veterans hospital was Paul Beeson. And I'd read Beeson and McDermott. You know, he was one of my mentors as I became an internist. And what a lovely, beautiful man he was. And there are some people who should never die. And Paul Beeson is one of them. Malcolm P. 
Peterson I knew too. Peterson? Yeah. Another lovely man. I didn't even know that he'd died. Um, I always felt with PSR that we had the tools to save the planet. And in fact, and indeed, we did end the Cold War. And how it started was that we started, I, I was writing a paper for the New England Journal asked by Arnold Relmond to write a paper about the medical implications of nuclear power. And I spent a year researching that subject. In fact, the paper was rejected because when it was peer reviewed, they said, well, you didn't give the other side. And I said, but there is no other side medically. It's like saying, well, polio is bad produces infantile paralysis, but in, on the other hand, it's got some good features. <laughs> and I said, there aren't any, so they rejected the paper. But as I was studying this subject, and I was on the faculty at Harvard working in the cystic fibrosis unit, and I had a super boss called Harvey Colton. Some of you might have known him. He's just died of colonic cancer. I can't imagine the world without Harvey. He was a wonderful, wonderful, brilliant man who sat by and let me work and look through the Journal of Health Physics for a year, finding all these ghastly articles on Sellafield and, Win and ha Hanford and the like, waiting for me to come out of my stupor and get on with pouring bits of stuff in the lab, you know, and rising up through the Harvard faculty, maybe to become a professor. It never turned me on at all, but he was really fantastic. And during that time, a young man came to see me. He was an intern at Cambridge City Hospital called Ira Helfand. And there was a referendum in Cambridge uh, to stop all nuclear activities, which would have meant MIT closing down its reactor, Harvard stopping all nuclear activities and the like. And there was a strong push against that. And he said he needed some articles. And we were talking about this. And I gave him a few articles. And he said, I turned to him and I said, Ira, you know, this is a medical problem. Let's start a medical organisation. And he said, yeah, OK. And uh, we had the first meeting in my sitting room or study a week later. And there's a man called Richard Feinblum, who was previously, I think, treasurer of the old PSR, which wrote those two classic papers in the New England Journal of Medicine on a bomb dropping on Boston in the early 60s. And then anyway, the old PSR died. And uh, died, I think, in 71. But Richard said, look, it's still registered in the state of Massachusetts. Just use the name. You don't have to go through the re-registration and the like. So that's why this new organization, and it was new, reused the old name because it was registered and was easier to do. And thus we began. And what we did was um, it started in 78. And most people at the time, I'd just come to America a few years earlier, Ha said, most Americans said, well, it's better to be dead than red. And I said, you mean you'd rather be dead? Yes, we don't want to be communists. Not that they understood what that meant anyway. And I said, well, what about the pygmies in Africa? They'll die too. And they said, yeah, better they're dead too. They don't want to be communists either. Well, so what we did, the first thing we did was put an ad in the New England Journal of Medicine about the medical implications of nuclear power. And it happened to come out serendipitously the day after Three Mile Island melted down. Bang! We had 500 new members in a flash. We were working in a broom cupboard in Richard Feinblum's general practice in Harvard Square. And we, just, we were deluged with people. And so we just took off with a flying start. Um, and then we started to decide, we decided we'd do the first symposium at Harvard on the medical implications of nuclear war. And at the time, most of the old fellows from the Manhattan Project were still alive. Jerry, um, sorry, Jerry Wiesner, who was Ted Ken I mean Jack Kennedy's science advisor, Jerry said to me, he said, you know, one day I was standing in the Oval Office and Jack was standing there, as he did, with his hands behind his back, looking out the Oval Office windows and the rain was falling. And it was the time of the testing and the rain was full of strontium-90. And he said, he said, you mean, Jerry, there's radiation in that rain? And he said, yes, Mr. President. And that brought about the partial test ban treaty. George Kistiakowski, the chemist, who formed the implosion mechanism for the first bomb with the plutonium, first bomb named, uh, named Trinity after the Father, Son and Holy Ghost. And when Oppenheimer watched it explode, he said, I've become the death, 
the shatterer of worlds. And then he said, for the first time, physicists have known sin and they have been sinning ever since. And I'm fed up with them. I'm fed up with these people who are sinning. And they know damn well that E equals MC squared and to relieve the, release the energy inside the atom is just catastrophic. And Oppenheimer knew when he watched Trinity explode that he'd captured the energy in the stars and we could destroy the planet. And by God, we're very close to doing it. And by God, no one cares, except us maybe, and a few others, hardly any. Oh, well, Kissinger's got into it now, like after a long time, and George Schultz after a long time, but they're slow in learning. But we've led the way. So we had our first symposium at Harvard, two days, and by God, the press were fascinated. And of course, the Boston Globe the next day had the concentric circles of destruction and the bishops and the cardinals started reading about it. And they started to say, gee, Jesus wouldn't approve of this. <laughs> and as we got round to all the, all, the ca all the cities, we got to Seattle that Judy organised and they were scalping tickets at the door. It was amazing. And gradually, Hunthausen and Bernadine and all the others got together and they wrote the bishop's pastoral letter against nuclear war. And what we did too was spawn other groups. So we got architects for social responsibility, so psychologists, real estate agents. Um, I was asked to speak at the annual morticians conference about nuclear war and I said, well, why do you want me to talk? And they said, well, we don't want to have to embalm radioactive bodies. And I said, don't worry, you'll be one yourself, you know? So they passed a resolution against nuclear war. And uh, all the stratas of academia banded together. Architects said it was bad for architecture, bad for history, you know, archaeologists. And so we spawned, we sort of gave birth to all these other groups and they just rose up. So in 1982, what happened? We got a million people in Central Park. I also had a wonderful publicist called Pat Kingsley who heard me speak, I think in the LA uh, PSR uh, conference, and she said she'd work for me for free. And the way she did it was, oh, I was a boring old woman doctor, you know, in tweed suits talking about the medical effects of nuclear war. Who wants to listen to that? But she got Sally Field and Candy Bergen and, and Lily Tomlin on, and she'd ring up the producer and say, I'll give you the film stars, but you've got to have Helen Caldicott. Well, they did, you know. So I'd come on and Lily, for half an hour, she would have given all the effects, the medical effects and everything. There was nothing for me to talk about when I got on because Lily learnt the whole thing. But because of Kingsley, I was in Vogue, Family Circle, Ladies Home Journal, I mean everything. Merv Griffin, who's just died. Um, actually, I hit the, Merv Griffin was the first show I went on and I was on with Ava Gabor. And she had a big pink dress on, very low, but a big pink frill around there, and diamonds like the size of pears hanging from her ears. And, and um, I only had a little time to talk, and I was talking about the medical stuff, and she said, the Russians roll over children with tanks. And everyone clapped, and then we had a break for an ad. And I was so nervous, I picked up a glass of water and put it straight down my front. <laughs> And then I thought, children. So when it came back again, I said, yes, the children don't believe they're going to survive, like Natalie. And I got in just under the wire. You've got to be quick, you know, on television. And so Kingsley actually, through the media, mobilised 80% of Americans. We did it too, but it was through the media. And really, the media is determining the fate of the earth. I, was at, I gave a three-minute speech before this million people, a sea, an ocean of faces in New York, and I dropped the bomb. I didn't know what to say when I got up there, and I thought, yeah, I'll drop the bomb on them. And I was leaving Central Park, and a woman came rushing up. She said, were you on television this morning? I was actually on with Orson Welles. It was amazing. He was so huge, they had to lift him. He was in his wheelchair, lift him up with a crane onto the platform to speak. Anyway, she said, I was in the shower and I heard this voice saying, every town and city with a population of 50,000 or more is targeted with at least one bomb. She said, that's why I'm here. I didn't know that. You see, you just need one grab and people get it. 
So what we did was simply amazing and we got to recruit 23,000 physicians and by God were we powerful. And you're still powerful, but I used to travel around servicing, what, 123 chapters or something, and teach people how to speak on television and radio and, you know, become stars of stage, green and radio. And, and really, that's, that was the way to go. I won't go into a whole lot of history about what happened to me in PSR, but it's kind of in the book, taken from the minutes of our meetings. I believe that if PSR had continued the way it was going, by now we would have almost abolished nuclear weapons. And I want to just talk a little bit about where we're at today. We did bring an end to the arms, to the arms race with the freeze in a certain sense. I went to see Reagan and we went to see Gorbachev and it was spectacular and the Berlin Wall came down and I, I do lay that at our feet. We inst instigated that and it came about. And for that I congratulate all of us and that's practising global preventive medicine through the political process. George I got rid of a few weapons unilaterally and I've, I've written about that in this book the new nuclear danger, George Bush's military industrial complex. But then we got Clinton, who had no courage. He'd smoked some dope, but he didn't inhale, don't you know? He uh, never went to Vietnam, so he felt embarrassed. He had no courage. And he left the weapons in place. Instead of saying, right, we handed him on a silver plate the mechanism to abolish nuclear weapons. And there was a precedent for that when Reagan and Gorbachev met in Reykjavik in 1987. They almost, over a weekend, abolished nuclear weapons, if you remember. It was absolutely a stunning exercise. And then Clinton came in, and instead of getting in Air Force One with a document flying to Boris Yeltsin, who was a hardened alcoholic, a bottle of vodka before breakfast, Wernicke's encephalopathy, Korsakoff syndrome, the whole deal, and saying, Boris, sign here. We're going to abolish nuclear weapons in five years, which he could easily have done. He left the weapons in place. And that is his legacy. And his wife, wife is running now, and she has received more money from the military-industrial complex than any other candidate running. And I don't trust her. And just because she's good at raising money, just because she's good at raising money doesn't mean to say she's, she'll be a good president. And everyone gets on wagon and follows. Obama came out the other day to abolish nuclear weapons. You know, that's, no one's ever done that running for president before, and so is John Edwards. John Edwards? Yeah. He also is against nuclear power, incidentally. Obama takes money from Exelon, he's for it. Most people have no idea about the medical implications of nuclear power, none. Or the, or the, or the physics, or the chemistry, or the, or the engineering, none. Especially the candidates. We've got to teach them. So the weapons stayed in place. So then we get this <coughs> very low IQ president <laughs> who is, I don't know if he's a sociopath, but he's a very strange character. There's a book written about him called Bush on the Couch by a psychiatrist called Frank, which is absolutely fascinating. He had a very traumatic childhood. Suffice it to say, he's dyslexic. And, you know, I'm fascinated with analysing him. And I don't think anyone should get to be president or anyone in high office without being psychoanalyzed. But then you'll have to psychoanalyze the psychoanalysts to make sure they don't have a political agenda themselves. But, you know, the real etiology of where we're at today is in the reptilian midbrain. <laughs> and we use our left brain to rationalize what we really want to do in the reptilian midbrain. And there are some people who are well in control of their emotions, but many are not. And that's the dilemma of the human species. And unless we are prepared to look at the etiology of what's happening to our planet, we're doomed. So, as we just heard, there are five and a half thousand nuclear weapons on hair trigger alert here, and you've got most of them here in this beautiful state. And as I flew in yesterday, sitting next to a man working in Boeing, which is the second largest military contractor in the world, he is working on AWACS in Turkey. He's located in Turkey. What do AWACS do? Well, you know, the satellites, the geosynchronous satellites, 
target all the targets in Iraq and bomb wedding parties and, you know, the whole thing. That's called the militarisation of space. In fact, AWACS can look at the planes, they can look at the people on the ground and the tanks, and he's very excited about it. And I said, you know, what you're doing is not a... I didn't really take him on full frontal. I sort of left the poor fellow alone. <laughs> but then we flew over Boeing, miles and miles and miles of the bloody thing. And then there's Hanford which will never be cleaned up. You can't clean up radioactive waste. You can transfer it from one place to another, but you can't clean it up. And in the process, you expose more and more people to the radioactive isotopes and carcinogenesis. So today, Russia's got 2,500 weapons. There are only 240 major cities in the Northern Hemisphere. The data for nuclear winter has just been redone by the meteorologists and it's worse than originally predicted. A thousand bombs on a hundred cities would create nuclear winter and the end of life on Earth and plunge us back into an ice age. We're worried about global warming. This is the elephant in the sitting room that no one looks at or talks about, like Hillary. Oh, but you've got to be politically correct. You've got to please all the people who are funding you they're the corporations who run this country. They're the etiology, partly, of the pathology which faces the planet. But you see, we can cut through that, being doctors, and say this is medically contraindicated. And it's not being brave, it's just speaking our truth as we've learnt it as physicians. So we got to within 10 seconds of the world blowing up in 95 when Yeltsin nearly pressed the button when he thought that a Norwegian missile was a, an American missile and America still got a policy for a first strike winnable nuclear war against Russia. And they never know when you're going to strike and their satellites are all degraded and dilapidated, they don't work anymore. I honestly, when I collected the data for this, you know you do with a patient, all the tests and you examine them and do everything and you work out a prognosis. I absolutely don't know how we're still here. From a clinical perspective, from an intuitive perspective, I do not know how we're still here. We have a huge task ahead of us. You are probably the most exciting chapter in the country that remains. The work you're doing is stunning. Your commitment is amazing. I doff my cap to you. I'm proud of you. It's not really my doing, it's Judy's. She gave birth to you. The other issue that faces us is global warming. And I wrote about that in this book. Nuclear power is not the answer to global warming. I had a conference on this recently. Nuclear power produces global warming in its own right, in a major way. It's a socialised industry in a market, a free market economy. You know, it's kind of communism. I thought Americans were against communism. Um, and, of course, it's incredibly dangerous. Uh, most of the candidates don't know anything about that. So, therefore, the nuclear industry has found that, you know, they're actually the answer to global warming, as Dick Cheney says. They emit nothing. They're emission-free, which is all a lie. And uh, they're using Hill and Knowlton to propagandise the fact that they're clean, green and amazing. Hill and Knowlton did the tobacco industry advertising. This is a medical problem. This is a carcinogenic industry which will remain carcinogenic for half a million years, whose transient byproduct is the production of electricity for 20 years. As Albert Einstein said, nuclear power is a hell of a way to boil water. <laughs> I love what Einstein says. So the answer to global warming, I've produced a wonderful roadmap. Here's a, 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 an executive summary, but you can download it from IEER.org. The wonderful, brilliant man called Dr. Arjun Makajani produced it, 270 pages. All electricity in America and all transportation can be produced by the year 2050 with no carbon emissions. None. And nuclear power, you remove the subsidies and it closes down, bang, like that, bang. So the answer to global warming is here. This is the prescription for survival for global warming. And it's a prescription for survival for nuclear power. 
And all we've got to do is have the courage to lead a revolution in America as we led a revolution in the 80s. That was the second American revolution. To go from everyone supporting better dead than red to in five years, 80% of Americans saying, we want the arms race to end, we all want a nuclear weapons freeze. And it was sagacious, Gandhian, peaceful, led by doctors. That's our role. The earth is in the intensive care unit. It's acutely ill. And everybody on the planet is basically a physician to this dying planet. Whether we can save it or not, I don't know, as we don't know when total organ collapse develops in our patients and we lose it. We lose them. But sometimes when we stay up all night and we're totally committed to our patients, they survive. And that's how we were brought up. We get through the, that, that tiredness at 2 a.m. in the morning by having a milkshake and a hamburger and we keep going and our brains lighten up again and we can think clearly for our patients. And that's where we're at now. There is no more important time in the history of human beings on the planet than now, in three million years. And I do believe that it's us physicians who have the golden key to making sure life continues on the planet. And I don't just mean us, I mean 30 million other species. We're the curators of life on Earth, but we know how to get into people's psychics, psyches and break through their psychic numbing. We do it every day with our patients. That's what we've got to do with society and with all the politicians who all need doctors at some point in their lives. And it's basically about love. PSR, when we started, was about love. There was so much love in National PSR and with all of us. That's what we've got. That's what we're about. Our love and dedication to our patients. That's what motivates us. That's why we got into medicine. So do it. Lead the revolution. I'll be there to help you. Thank you.